Hi everyone, I'm Michael Roth. I'm from AMD and I'm here to talk about unmapped private memory. Uh, so unmapped private memory or UPM for short uh, refers to some proposed uh, kernel infrastructure to back confidential guests with pages that can't be accessed from user space. And uh, the initial implementation of that uh, unmapped private memory is uh, uh, Chao Ping's uh, private mem slot patch set uh, listed there. Uh, so when I reference UPM, I'm basically referring to the uh, changes introduced by that patch set. Um, now, UPM has been proposed by a number of developers for various reasons. But uh, as I understand things, the, uh, the main driver of UPM is uh, Intel TDX, where um, if user space tries to write to a private guest page, you'll get a machine check. So obviously it's very important to have uh, some sort of infrastructure like this in place for that use case. But uh, UPM is also being evaluated for uh, other uh, use cases in Wells, such as uh, SEV, SMP, uh, PKVM, I think also has a prototype and, and possibly others are, are looking at it as well. Um, now, I'm from AMD, so obviously, you know, SMP is sort of my main focus for, uh, you know, where we could utilize uh, UPM. Uh, so some of the descriptions and topics here might be a bit SMP-centric, uh, but I'm hoping that this is generally useful for some of these other use cases as well. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so with UPM, uh, you have a new private mem slot uh, structure in KVM. Uh, and before we get into that, just uh, just a quick recap of how things look with uh, a normal uh, KVM mem slot uh, in the context of, of SMP in this case. So uh, here in the, the diagram on the right here, you have uh, guest A uh, in its page table. It has uh, a couple uh, GPAs mapped in its page table. There's 2000H, which is uh, mapped as a shared page, and 3000H, which is mapped as a private page. Um, now, when there's a, a nested page fault and the KVM MMU needs to figure out uh, what, um, what host page to use to uh, program into the nested page table to satisfy the nested page fault, in both of those cases, it's going to uh, do the lookup the same way. It's going to uh, use the GPA to index into the mem slot, and then from that mem slot, it can get the host virtual address, and then from the VMM's process, the VMM processes uh, page table, it can then uh, figure out what HPA, uh, what, what host physical address uh, that HPA maps to, and then that's what it programs into the nested page table. So here's how things look like with the private mem slot uh, implementation. Here, uh, you see for the, the shared page, uh, 2000H, the lookup is handled the exact same way. But in the case of the private page, 3000H, uh, there's this, uh, there's this when, 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 KVM, when the KVM MMU is doing, when handling the, uh, the nested page fault, it'll see in this, this X array that the uh, GPA 3000H um, is backed by uh, private memory. So in that case, instead of doing the normal lookup, it'll look, uh, it'll use the GPA to figure out uh, the, what index in this new memory, this, this special memory FD uh, backend to use to get to the uh, uh, host physical address that should be programmed into the, the nested page table. And that's sort of how things look when the guest, when the guest expects a private page and the uh, and KVM already has that recorded and mapped as a private page uh, using the memfd. But you also have to deal with things like uh, shared to, to private conversions and, and private to shared conversions. So uh, in this case, we have an implicit conversion where um, where the guest tries to access the uh, page by, where the guest tries to, to, to flip the page to private by flipping its C bit. And, and so in this case, the, uh, the X-ray originally had that page uh, 
mapped to a, a shared page, um, but now the guest is trying to access it as a, a private page. So in that case, you get a nested page fault and the KVM MMU will see that the, uh, that the page is not backed by a private page like the guest is expecting. So in that case with UPM, there's now this new KVM exit memory fault, which will exit out to user space and the VMM will then uh, figure out the uh, corresponding index in the uh, memfd and uh, make sure that a page is allocated there. And then it'll issue a KVM ioctl back to KVM to tell it to update the state of that page in the, um, in the X array. And then at that point, when you resume the guest, it should be able to, uh, the KVM MMU should be able to handle the, uh, the, the nested page fault without exiting back to user space. And uh, we also have a, for SMP, we also have uh, explicit conversions where the guest will tell uh, KVM in advance via a, a hypercall that, the, um, that it intends to use a particular page as a private page or a shared page. So in this case, it's telling uh, the, the hypervisor that 3008 should be a, a private page. And currently with uh, the SMP hypervisor patches, um, that's all handled in the kernel. But with UPM, we forward that, uh, that page state change out to the uh, VMM in the form of a, 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 KV, a new KVM exit, VMG exit. And then uh, the VMM will then do the same thing it does in the, in the implicit conversion case. It'll make sure that the memory is allocated in the memfd backend, and then issue a KVM ioctl to uh, uh, flip the state of that page in the, the X-ray here. And then at that point, you can satisfy the, uh, the, the nested page fault. Uh, so there's a, a number of, of, of pros and cons with uh, UPM that I've, I've listed here. But on the, on the pro side, uh, I guess sort of the, the, the main promise of UPM is that it provides uh, potentially shared infrastructure uh, for, for managing private pages, both for SMP and for TDX, because currently with SMP, we sort of have our own sort of SEV specific mechanisms for handling uh, private pages. Uh, and we have certain requirements around there, like uh, we need to make sure that the pages are pinned. Uh, and things of that nature, and then TDX might have its own requirements as well. So with UPM, we could potentially have all that handled with common infrastructure and, and, and all the, the good things that, that come out of that. Um, but um, in trying to utilize UPM for, for SMP support, uh, you know, th there are certain things that are still sort of SMP specific, platform specific, and in some cases, there's no way around that. Um, like we need to update the RMP table in the case of SMP to uh, note that the, the the page should be treated as 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 shared or private. But there's some other things where it's 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 sort of up in the air whether uh, UPM uh, should handle that functionality um, because uh, in, in some cases there's similar requirements uh, between SMP and, and and TDX, and that sort of brings us to. Uh, our, our first discussion topic, which is um, sort of along that line, is um, another sort of requirement we have with SMP is, uh, you know, normally the, uh, a thread in the host can't write to a guest private page, which makes sense because there's never um, a good reason for the host to be writing to a private page because it's, it's you know, oh, more. Back to the previous slide, Michael, sure. uh, under the cons, you had one listed that uh, I want to bring attention to. Uh, it was the uh, potential to allocate double the memory. Mm -hmm. So I know like at least in our setup, when we run a VM, we actually run it inside of a container and the container is configured with a memory limit. Like let's say you have like a, a, a 16 gigabyte VM. So you put 16 gigabytes in there plus a little bit of extra, you know, maybe another gigabyte. So I'm just making up some fudge here. So that for the, so you have some memory for like the, the user space hypervisor and whatever else you need. And so the reason we do that is because the whole point of cloud is to have efficiency and, you know, user infrastructure. Well, so if we're, if we're allocating up to two X the memory, because it's both in the private FD and the shared FD, then that's sort of a non-starter. So that's one thing I just, um, 
this patch set's really awesome, but that's one thing that's been a concern of mine with it. Yeah, and there's there's also a flip side to that too, where you can avoid the 2x memory usage by every time there's a page state change, you deallocate the page from say the shared uh, allocation. And then when you, you reallocate it in the, the, pri the private backends, um, you know, you, you make sure that you deallocate it so, so you don't have that sort of um, you know, double the usage. But if you do that every time, sometimes you have use cases where, like I think currently in OBMF, uh, to handle bounce buffers, it'll flip the page to shared, do the DMA, and then flip it back to private, and it'll do that like a thousand times. And if you're allocating and deallocating every time that happens, then I think in our case, it was like a, a 3x slowdown for a fairly small guest, and then it's probably more significant the, the larger you go. So, so that, that sort of raises the question of, you know, do you need some sort of kind of uh, garbage collection sort of implementation in the VMM? And yeah, there's, there's a lot of complications around that, but, um, but at, at least on the kernel side, there's, there's a lot of good stuff to uh, UPM and, and you know, the, you know, the main thing being the shared infrastructure, but uh, in order to get the most out of that, there's, there's a, a couple uh, other cases that are possibly worth considering using UPM for, and one of them is uh, how we handle the kernel direct map. Um, so, uh, you know, we, you know, as I mentioned, you, you can't, there's, there's no good reason for uh, a thread in the host to write to a private guest page. But in some cases, uh, because the thread in the host might use a huge mapping, it might not be trying to write to a guest page. It might be trying to write to some other page. Um, or, or, you know, it might be trying to write to a shared guest page, which is perfectly fine. But because that, that overlap overlaps with a private page, then... Um, uh, you can have issues in some cases. In, in user space, if that happens, that's fine because you can just tell user space to, you can just split the page in the user space mapping and everything's fine. But in the kernel, we also have the direct map and the kernel direct map is, is uh, it uses two megabyte mappings by default. So uh, there's a, so, so you know, it, when, when you have that same situation in, in the kernel, you, you can't just dynamically split the page when, when you get a, a page fault, you have to sort of figure out how to deal with it in advance. And there's a few different approaches for how to deal with that. We've sort of flip-flopped between a, a couple of these, but I think uh, the approach that we plan to take here is to, um, you know, anytime you uh, switch a page to private, you will then split the corresponding entry in the direct map. And the downside to that currently is that there's there's no interface currently to restore the direct map as a two megabyte entry later, but I think that's that's a solvable problem. So this is a, a fairly elegant solution. Um, but as I understand it, there's there's also a similar requirement on a TDX side, which sort of raises the question of whether UPM should also handle uh, dealing with the um, uh, direct map as well. So I, you know, I don't know if there's any input from, from the audience on, on that, but that's just sort of something I wanted to raise that, uh, you know, maybe we could follow up on the mailing list. Um. So a little short on time, and this might take up a good amount. So I'm going to skip to the third uh, discussion topic I have here. And, and that's, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier when we have a uh, explicit page state change request, um, we forward that request out to user space. And those page state change requests are, uh, in the case of SMP, uh, they can do batching where you can tell the hypervisor that you want to flip you know, 200 or so pages from private to shared. And that all happens at once. Um, and, you know, to, to sort of maintain that batch, and currently we uh, introduced this new KVM exit, VMG exit, so that that could be handled in user space. Um, but, you know, that sort of differs from what's been introduced in the UPM patch set, which is this KVM exit memory fault. So I guess one question is, could we potentially 
instead of forwarding that GHCB request out to user space and having this SMP specific handling that user space needs to deal with, can we reuse the KVM exit memory fault, but then also add, you know, sort of SG list support to it so that it could also uh, retain this, this, this batching support so that you could handle it the same way between SMP and TDX. So that's 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 you know another um, possible thing to consider extending UPM support for that um, potentially follow up on. And uh, another one uh, I'll touch on quickly. I, I don't think we have too much time to discuss, but another one is um, a host kernel thread might be trying to access shared memory for a variety of things like uh, the KVM clock, VertIO buffers, GHCB pages. Um, but in some cases, uh, you might have a malicious guest that tries to flip those pages to private while the host is using them. And the question is, you know, how do you deal with that without uh, allowing a guest to, to crash the host. And the, uh, the approach we plan to take for SMP is to, um, you know, basically introduce some handling in the host page fault handler so that whenever the host uh, is accessing a page that it thinks is supposed to be shared and somehow that page has got flipped to private, then we just automatically flip it back to shared. And if the host did that in error, then um, uh, the guest will know about it because when we do that, uh, we'll unset the validated bit. So the guest will notice it and we don't silently corrupt memory. Mark? Yeah, I, this, I feel this idea that like Peter in front of me actually had brought to the mailing list like before the whole UPM got kicked off in the context to be applied generically like you presented so well for Intel and uh, uh, AMD. And it felt like the one of the maintainers, uh, Andy Ludo was very negative on it editing fault.c to do that that automatic conversion. Um, that So I'm wondering, yeah, we could obviously try that again. And I, I recall he said something like uh, he needs to see any code and, and maybe that can be dealt with. I know there were some pretty nasty race conditions that could fail in fault.c. So alternatively, I don't know if we can, uh, in the RMP update helper, maybe like have some data structure that marks these pages that are locked as shared and block the, the conversion in that case or take that sort of approach. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, the issue there is, um, you know, what if you do something like KVM vCPU map, um, you know, currently that basically just does a, a K map on the page and there's really no mechanism in place currently to sort of invalidate that mapping if it keeps trying to use it. So I think you'd end up needing to introduce a lot of infrastructure to support that. And if that ends up being the case, then maybe that's a problem that UPM needs to solve because I, I doubt they would want that for something SMP specific or at least some sort of common infrastructure. Yeah, is this another way for the guests to use up more? Like you mentioned that with UPM, we can use double the memory for the same GPA space. If we're writing, you know, it could the kernel could be acting correctly and writing where the guest is telling it to, but causing extra memory allocations because of UPM. How, th this seems tricky to deal with, you know, how do we not, ex, you know, add extra GPA space just because the kernel's, the host is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Is that, is that correct? Am I, am I thinking about that? Um, well, I, I think in, in the case of the host, I don't think it would necessarily cause an additional allocation. I, I, I guess may, maybe because it's holding on to the, the page reference. Well, it has to make the new, if, it, if you're writing to a private page, and as shared, you're now adding back the you're you're now adding back the memory in the shared uh, mem slot, right? So you are growing memory. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the case of a kernel thread, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, exactly I'm not sure what happens in that, in that situation. That would, be but user space, yeah, definitely, it could accidentally cause an allocation if it continues writing uh, to memory that's now private. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably it for time, right? Okay, I think uh, time is up. Um, thanks, Michael, for the presentation. <laughs> Next one is Steph Murek from IBM talking about security pooling confidential VMs with encrypted disks.
good morning. Um, okay, so this is uh, work I did with Tobin, who's on the other side of town, um, and a few others, of course, on the help of the community. Um, so, as everything here uh, today, we're talking about confidential VMs, and we're interested in the case where we don't uh, trust the host, and I want to discuss a few approaches for encrypting the uh, guest's uh, disk, and I have no solutions today, so uh, start the community uh, discussions. I also want to refer to yesterday's talk uh, in the Secure Boot mi Microconference from GON uh, Yao and Ken Liu from uh, Intel, who also did a talk about confidential um, encrypted disk. So uh, some of these uh, overlap. Oh, so the approaches I think uh, we should, um, how, how should we uh, evaluate the approaches is of course, we want confidentiality and integrity. And ideally, if we can make an approach that uh, works not just with one architecture, but with several or all, ideally, and something that would be easy to use for customers, for example, whether they can build and test the image locally without the, let's say, SMP or TDX, and then uh, send it to the cloud and run it uh, securely there. So what's currently available, for example, in uh, QMU is something called encrypted QCOW, um, which is a local disk. It also can be remote, and the VMM performs the decryption, and you give the VMM the passphrase. So indeed, on disk, it is stored um, encrypted, but the host, the VMM, has the decryption key and sees all the plain threat plain text um, sectors running uh, to and from the guest. So we consider this uh, uh, not secure because the key is here in the untrusted uh, area. Uh, so first approach uh, for confidential is, uh, was uh, built by uh, James here. Um, basically it, in, it says, let's do the decryption inside the guest in uh, Grub, but we want Grub to be part of the measurement. So um, we build OVMF with a built-in Grub. Uh, so there's one package, you load OVMF, it has Grub uh, built in uh, in it. And that Grub also has a module which allows reading the secret uh -huh. memory. So, um, so uh, Nobody has to type the secret. Basically, you do secret injection in SCV, pre-boot secret injection, and then um, Grub decrypts the disk and continues to load the kernel and the inventory and all the stuff from, uh, from there. Um, one moment, let me finish that. Um, uh, so the idea here is that everything, measure everything, until the unlocking, so OVMF and Grub are uh, measured, and therefore, if the measurement is wrong, we won't, the guest owner won't inject the secret and uh, uh, will not allow the decryption. And we have kernel and init ID inside the encrypted envelope, so if there's something secret there, um, they're encrypted as well. Um, it relies on the early secret injection, so it's I'd say more problematic to do in SMP and TDX, where you need currently the way to get the attestation report is later uh, in user space. Uh, the grub patches to add this module are not upstream, and the combined packaging of this OVMF, which includes grub in it as a one unit, uh, we had some trouble uh, getting it accepted to the various parties that need to do that, yes. Just an update. I am Grab my planner. I'm going to take these patches for next release, which will happen probably at the turn of, of this year. I will be working with uh, James on, on, on these patches. Okay, good. So it might be upstream as opposed to what's written here. Thank you. So second uh, thing we looked at is uh, basically doing it later during boot in uh, initRD. So 
Um, VM starts booting, uh, loads uh, OVMF, loads um, kernel, loads initRD. And then during initRD, there's a crit setup um, Lux uh, open, and that will do the decryption. And now we need to get the passphrase there. So what we do is in, just before crypt setup, we uh, get the attestation report. Uh, if you need a nonce, uh, so first ask for the nonce, we get the attestation report, and then we send it to the guest owner and receive the passphrase and then do the unlocking. Um, but what we need to have here is we need to measure everything up to that point. So we need to somehow make sure that the kernel and the initRD contain no malicious code that can steal the, the passphrase, for example. Um, so uh, the way we did it but for SCV and uh, SCVS, we have uh, patches. We, it's already upstream in QMU and OVMF um, to include the hashes of um, kernel, kernel command line, and initRD inside the guest. So the hashes are included in the initial measurement and they're passed in uh, from QMU. And basically OVMF verifies that what it's going to load uh, with direct boot is what indeed was measured. Um, so that makes it secure for that point. And we also have these uh, RFC patches for uh, <laughs> Similarly, for SNP, for TDX, you basically uh, can use the same approach, but you need to verify the, the measurement differently. If um, um, the full TDX support basically says there are these runtime um, registers like TPM PCRs, which can measure, extend the measurement for kernel, for initRD, and so on, you need all the pieces in place in OVMF, in Grub. Uh, in the kernel, and once you have this, uh, you can verify the measurement as well up to the point of uh, unlocking. Um, we see that each um, enclave has their own way of getting that attestation report. So there is one IOCTL in TDX and another one in SNP. Um, so that init script need to have all these ifs in it. Maybe this can be abstracted away by something like Clevis. I have no experience with it, but I was uh, told that it can do it, uh, or it can be added uh, elegantly there. Um, I'm not sure if it makes sense to unify that, let's say, in the kernel to have slash dev attestation or something. I'm not sure because the actual blobs are pretty different between the architectures. Uh, okay, so we, this is working. Basically, we have tried it. Uh, I just say a caveat that on TDX, we it's working, but we didn't uh, have all the correct measurement checking in place. But for the other, uh, but basically the machinery is working on all of them. And downsides here is um, kernel and initRD are not encrypted. Um, they're basically the host passed them. Uh, it's okay, for example, we are using this uh, scheme in confidential computing where this uh, kernel on initRD basically contains the runtime how to run, sorry, confidential containers, which uh, these initRD contains the runtime of how to start a new container. That's open source, that's public. We have no need to encrypt that. We just need to measure that. Um, but uh, if you have cases where the guest can run, I don't know, ups, update kernel or something uh, and uh, get in, and replace the kernel and then the measurement changes, how, how does that uh, play along? Um, so measurement, of course, needs to, it don't, not only includes just the OVMF, it has to include all the parts. It makes it harder to verify. Maybe Peter has a magic solution in the next talk. Um, and hardening is more difficult because there's more um, area which can access the secret and, and do something wrong. Um, this is actually true for the entire life cycle of the guest. So if something in the guest later, even after decryption, something 
allows the host to, I don't know, connect a device that causes a problem and then exposes something, then it's not confidential. So. Okay, now uh, approaches that look like um, TPM. So in physical TPM, uh, physical machines which have TPM can do full disk encryption or unlocking uh, either script setup uh, and their um, I see patches to do this uh, as well in uh, Grub, earlier in Grub. Um, so can we use something similar in confidential VMs um, to do the unlocking? Um, again, like full disk encryption that we talked about earlier, um, everything is measured and the kernel and interd are encrypted as well. So that's nice, but this VTPM is currently in the air. For SNP, we know that they have um, this mechanism called VMPL, which allows you basically to run part of the guest as a higher privilege from the rest of the guest. So we can have VTPM running in VMPL zero, which has the higher uh, privilege, and the rest of the kernel and the OS in uh, VMPL one. And that makes sure that both the VTPM is not accessible both from the host because it's inside the enclave and also not from the guest OS. So the guest OS kernel, let's say, cannot modify the PCR values or stored inside this VTPM. Um, but outside of SNP, can, can we, do we have an idea how to do this? Um, I don't. Um, well, in TDX, there are ideas of something like another TD VM that somehow has a higher privileges and can look into that uh, the main customer VM, uh, but I'm low on details on that. And now the question with VDPM is, um, so in hardware uh, TPM, you have storage, you have a small NVRAM that is persistent. How do you do that? And it's secure, so you cannot, uh, the host cannot read it. Um, how do you do that in cloud? Uh, how do you have something which is uh, persistent and encrypted and, I mean, protected from the host and uh, available to the, to the guest at runtime? That's a question. Uh, one other idea that uh, James once uh, raised is if we go back to the, first first uh, slide which mentioned uh, encrypted QCOW images. Uh, the problem there was that uh, decryption was done in the VMM which is outside which is untrusted outside the envelope. Can we have the same thing do the decryption somehow inside the guest but in a level where the rest of the guest sees a plain text disk as li like um, the encrypted QCAL that we have today in, in QMU. Um, so somehow move the decryption code from QMU to inside the guest. But uh, where exactly inside the guest um, this code can be, I don't know, when disk drivers, something like that. And how can this uh, decryption layer receive the disk passphrase or uh, decryption keys again? It's an open question, has to be very, very early in the guest because the moment, I don't know, OVMF will want to read the first sector of the disk, uh, this will need to go into play and decrypt. Um, so it's more questions as I promised than answers. Um, yes, and that's it. And if anyone has any other ideas or uh, ways we should pursue or should not pursue, I'll be happy to. Yeah, so um, from the solutions you showed, I think for standard virtual machines, not for containers, but for virtual machines, full-blown virtual machines, uh, to me it looks like it goes into the direction of having a virtual TPM somewhere in the system, either in with SNP in a, in a, a lower VMPL where it's secure or in a separate 
um, TEE, which you can do with TDX, but also with SCV and SCVES. So um, we've all, we already see uh, deployments using uh, such a setup, and I think others will adopt that. So for example, the, the uh, Microsoft Cloud, their confidential offering uses a TPM for disk unlocking and... Yes, so we, so I agree. Um, and that's what they do. For, that's at least what uh, they write they do on uh, with SNP. Um, we try to think whether whether it's possible to have this with a secure TPM. So I w it is possible if some part of the TPM is run is executed on the host, then it's not and it's not secure, right? Yeah, the 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 TPM needs to be hidden from the host. Yeah. And on SNP, you can do that with VMPLs and the SVSM you uh, had in your slides. Um, all others can use a separate um, secure VM, and all the hypervisor needs to do is provide a secure channel between the VM itself and the uh, and TPM. The, and the other, yeah. and the yeah. TPM. Communication yeah. needs to be encrypted and all, but yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is something we can uh, explore. Maybe. Whoever was suggesting the use of a secure VM for the VTPM, how do you ensure that that VTPM is running on the same secure host as the host you're measuring? I'm not sure it has to be on the same host, but you want to make sure that um, it's your VTPM, I don't know, that, that you're running it and not... Uh, uh, someone else who can steal your secrets, or um... yeah, the if the TPN is running in a, in a separate um, secure environment, it also needs to be able to send an attestation report to the virtual machine to so that the virtual machine can actually verify that it's the correct TPM and that um, yeah, it's what is what is expected to run there. Yes, Peter. So with the with the VTPM in a separate VM, unfortunately, you're using double the resources. So when we have limited, so we have ACIDs and we have HKIDs, we then double that for every VM, and that that could be a big cost. Yeah, what you double is the ACIDs, but not the memory. And the TPM basically only uses one vCPU, and it. Yeah, it's it's more the ACIDs and, and on TDX the HKIDs that are that are concerned because those are those are much more limited than the memory. I think there's only. A couple hundred on, on AMD and, and less on TDX. Yeah. So that's a, a downside for this approach of extra VM for, for each VTPM. Okay. okay, if there are not, no more questions, then I think it's also time to move on to the next session. Thanks, Dov.